sing that to him. You take it all away. You take it all away. You take it all away to all this left is you. You take it all away. You can take it all away. You can take it all away to all.
If you haven't grabbed your communion elements, grab now, because today we're gonna take it all together at one time. This morning, as I was preparing, I, I led the huddle for our serve team, and as I was preparing for it, I was also reading about communion, and I was reading in Luke specifically, when Jesus tells the disciples that he's going to be going, he's sat being sacrificed, and he's presenting communion for the first time, it's interesting to me that almost immediately afterward, the disciples start fighting with one another. They're in this argument with each other about who's the greatest, which one of them's gonna be the one right at Jesus's right hand. And it got me thinking about us. It got me thinking about the way in which we tend to handle our lives as well. We have these moments where we interact with God in deep and meaningful ways. Maybe it's on a Sunday morning. And then we go from that right back into our mess. And that's part of the reason why we do this. That's part of the reason why we have communion. It's so that we can stop and we can remember what Christ has done for us. Because if it were up to us, we would just constantly be in the mess. We would constantly be falling short of what we're made to be, what we're capable of. But now's our moment to be able to stop, to reflect, to remember the sacrifice that Jesus made so that we could be made right with him. So today, let's take a few moments, center our hearts, and then we'll take communion together. Let me pray for us. Father God, we just come before you recognizing how much we need you. Lord, your sacrifice at the cross is the only thing that can make us new, is the only thing that can make us right with you. And we just pray that as we take communion today, that we do so with that remembrance in our heart, that we recognize the sacrifice you made, that we lay down all of our junk at the foot of the cross here today, all of the mess, all of the, the places where we fall short, we lay it at your feet we thank you for what you have given us. In your name we pray, amen. And he took the bread and when he had given thanks, he broke it and he gave it to them saying, this is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's take the bread together. Likewise, the cup, after they had eaten, saying, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. Let's take this in remembrance of his sacrifice as well. Thank you. 
Father, we can stand before you. We can lift our eyes to you, straight to you, because of your son, Jesus. Even if you don't provide one more thing, even if you don't answer one more prayer, even if you don't heal, everything that you have done, everything that you are is way more than enough. done pretending we want the real thing God help us to be those people please in this hour we're done pretending we want the real thing I want to plead the real blood of the living Jesus Christ over my life my family this church this community this nation the whole world the real living blood of Jesus Christ. God, help your people today. Help us to see you in your holy, holy word. Let it soften hearts. Let it break chains as it always has and always will. We love you, Lord. We thank you for the cross. We thank you for this communion, this table we have. We love you, Lord. It's in his name that we pray. And everyone said, amen. amen. Man, thank you, team. What an awesome morning. Well, welcome. Hey, good morning. So good to see you guys. I feel like it's been forever since I have been the one preaching on this platform. It's been a little bit. Uh, with all the crazy stuff we had going on. We had our youth takeover last week. That was incredible. Yeah, awesome stuff. But welcome. We're so glad you're here worshiping with us. Those of you joining us online, thank you for taking some time to join us here today as well. Just such an incredible day. So what motivates you? What, what, what's the thing that, that kind of gets you moving? This, I think sometimes is a little bit of an existential question, right? It can be bigger than what, what it seems, but... You know, for some, maybe money, money is the ultimate motivator. I know a lot of people that work really terrible jobs, but the pay's good, so they're okay doing it. 
Sometimes it's peer pressure for good or for bad, right? You, you wanna see what your, your, how your friends interact and the people that you're around interact with something. Sometimes, and oftentimes I think for us, it's, it's the allure of comfort that's our motivator, right? What can I do? Maybe it's just this one more thing. And once I get that one more thing, then I'll be comfortable. I'll be happy. Things will be okay. There's a hundred things I think that can motivate us in the way in which we choose to live our lives. But often when we choose these things to be driven by these things, oftentimes what we arrive at is something that leaves us feeling empty, something that leaves us feeling just lacking in something, right? A few weeks ago, I got caught up in this thread um, that was just, someone asked this question, those of you who interact with the ultra wealthy, so billionaires, what are some of the things that you see them do? Like what's some of the behaviors? What's some of the, what's some of the weird stuff that you wouldn't expect people to see? And, and I spent way longer reading this thread than, <laughs> than I should because it's just so incredible, I think, from, from someone in, in like my position and probably where most of you fall too in the same basic economic world, right? Um, it was so crazy to see the ways in which just anything they wanted is at their fingertips. You've got these situations where someone inherited this mega yacht and they went to see what it would cost to park at the marina and the marina was so expensive. They're like, I'm just gonna buy the marina. It's cheaper for me. Like you've got these situations where, man, I don't know that I like having a neighbor a half a mile from me. I'm just gonna buy their entire property too and take care of that. Like these crazy situations where these ultra wealthy, the people that we would probably in the world's eyes look at and go are successful, are doing these crazy things. And honestly, these are things that some of us find our motivation in, right? We wanna be at that place. We wanna have that kind of money. But all of these people were able to have anything they wanted at the drop of a hat. But time and time and time again, these people would say, you know, when you can get anything you want, are the relationships in your life real? Or are they people just hanging out with me because of what I can offer them? Are they agreeing with me on this issue or this idea or are they just agreeing because I happen to have the checkbook? See, this emptiness that comes from what we would consider to be from a worldly standard, a measure of success, right? This emptiness that they were feeling showed that the motivation of money and power and authority and all of these things still left them feeling empty still left them feeling like they were missing something. And I think for so many of us, that measure of success or even that motivation is the thing that we chase and the eventual end point leaves us in the same exact boat in that feeling of emptiness. Now, I'm not using this example to get down on anyone who does have money. I'm not using this example to even um, talk down on somebody who's pursuing success in that way because I think God can use the pursuit and, and the success in order for his kingdom to grow and to become something greater, become something bigger. But I bring this up because this whole conversation is centered around motivation. What is the thing that drives you to do what you do? What is the thing that helps you live your life the way you live your life? And is that the right thing? Is it the thing that it should be? Today, we're continuing our conversation in the book of Ephesians, and we're gonna be looking at the truth that the gospel is actually the greatest motivator, the ultimate motivator in the lives of believers. And the gospel is enough. The gospel is enough. So what do I mean by that? Well, the, the truth is, I think we're pretty good at making excuses on the way in which we live our lives, right? We're good at making excuses in the way that we follow Jesus. We're good at justifying way we, why we interact with people the way we do, why we treat certain people one way and other people another way. We can justify division in a lot of ways, especially when the world around us is constantly fostering division. We can unintentionally allow our hearts and our minds to be shaped by the everyday people that we spend time with. And oftentimes, that struggle that we have then grows to share Jesus with the people around us because we struggle to share Jesus with people that aren't similar to us, that aren't around the same type of demographic. We're good at trying to chase things that make us feel comfortable instead of chasing the things in our lives that actually matter. And when we do these things, we're often chasing the things in our lives that we hope bring us happiness and meaning, and then we end up feeling lost and beat up and down whenever we get it because we realize we're missing the point. The beauty of what we're into today is Paul understood this. 
See, when Paul was speaking in his letter of Ephesians, he's writing to people that are the same as you and I, the same who are struggling with the same stuff that we struggle with. It's so funny how often you'll, people will say, oh man, why are we reading this book that was written thousands of years ago? It doesn't even apply to today's world. Well, if you spend enough time in it, you'll see eh, it applies a lot more than you think. We, we actually are going through the same exact tensions. And what Paul does in this letter is he faces those tensions head on and he gives us the answer to these big problems in our lives. And that answer is Jesus. The gospel of Jesus is what we need to find life. The reality that Jesus offers us freely, this ability to be made alive, to experience life the way it was meant to live. The gospel is enough. Let me bring us back up to speed on where we've been throughout this book of Ephesians in this series. Uh, This whole series is all meant to do basically two things. It's supposed to show us what the calling of the church is, and then it's going to show us how to practically live that out. Right now, we're still kind of in the first half of that conversation. The first half of the letter is all about what is the church meant to be? What is the calling of the church? Paul describes in this some crazy things, the immensity of God's love. He lays out the amazing power of Jesus to reconcile us with God, that God loved us so much that he sent his son to die so that we could have life. And throughout the first three chapters of Ephesians, Paul really lays out this power of Jesus. What he has done throughout this whole section that we've gone through up to this point is he's laid out this reality that Jesus has the power to bring things back from the dead. He has the power to resurrect our lives. Then last week, a few weeks ago rather, um, Tucker brought us a message where he talked about this power that Jesus has to bring people back together. He talked about this issue of Gentiles versus Jews and this division that existed. But now there is one people under the banner of Jesus, one people, a unity that has made an incredible impact on the way in which we embrace people outside of our comfort zones the way in which we're able to call each other family, even when we come from crazy different backgrounds. Today then, we're gonna be looking at Ephesians 3, chapter three, verses one through 13. Um, So if you do have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. This is where we're gonna be camping for the rest of the morning, whether you have your Bible, whether it's on your phone. If you do not have one, please stop by the hub before you leave because we would love for you to have the ability to take this with you when you go. Um, We don't want you to just isolate your time in the word to being here with us together, but be able to spend time in it outside of this building. But Ephesians 3 is where Paul's gonna lead us in this next part of the conversation about the gospel being enough. So Ephesians 3, for this reason, I'm gonna pause right there. (laughs) For this reason. So everything that Paul has said up to this point, all of the conversations about bringing the dead back to life, the conversations about unifying the division of people, all of these have been proofs of the gospel of Jesus. These have all been things that have helped us to understand what it means to follow him. They're proofs that the gospel is real and how Jesus is capable of transforming everything. I, Paul, prisoner of Christ Jesus on behalf of the Gentiles, assuming that you have heard of the stewardship of God's grace that was given to me for you, how the mystery was made known to me by revelation as I have written briefly. When you read this, you can perceive my insight into the mystery of Christ, which was not made known to the sons of man in other generations, as it now has been revealed to his holy apostles and the prophets by the spirit. This mystery is that the Gentiles are fellow heirs, members of the same body, partakers of the promise in Christ Jesus through the gospel. Paul continues to focus once again on this unification, this idea that you've got these two people group that that are at war with one another and now they are one. They have been made one family. They are all welcome into God's family. And every person because of Jesus is now able to be part of this new thing, the church. Every person is now welcome. The reason why he died on the cross is so that we could be made whole. And part of being made whole is this reunification of God's people. Of this gospel, I was made a minister according to the gifts of God's grace, which was given me by working of his power. To me, though I am the very least of the saints, this grace was given. To preach to the Gentiles the unsearchable riches of Christ and to bring to light for everyone what is the plan of the mystery hidden for ages in God who created all things. This phrase that Paul starts this section with 
of this gospel could very easily be translated because of this gospel, meaning that everything that Paul has done, everything Paul has been talking about, everything that Paul has gone through in his life is brought meeting because the gospel is worth it. The gospel is worth it because of this gospel. I think in order to really understand how big that statement is, we need to understand a little bit more about Paul because there's lots of things about Paul that we'll talk about in the context of church, but we don't always dive into the whole story. See, Paul has not only been laying out this calling of this church in the first few sections of this letter, he's also been in some ways laying out this proof of the validity of the gospel and it all ties back to his story. See, he's highlighted these things. Like, if you just look at the fact that Jesus can bring things back from the dead, that's enough proof for the gospel to be real, right? But then he goes on and he says, not only that, but look around you. We're all here together at this place, at this time. None of us would be in this room at the same place in the same time if it weren't for Jesus. This is incredible. That in and of itself is another reason why the gospel is real. The gospel is true. So Paul's laid these two things out. And then he goes on to this new point, this new point that's rather powerful in this conversation. In verse 10, he says, so that through the church, the manifold wisdom of God might be known, to be made known to the rulers and authorities of heavenly places. This was according to the eternal purposes that he has realized in Christ Jesus our Lord, in whom we have boldness and access and confidence through our faith in him. So I ask you not to lose heart. What I am suffering, which is your glory what I am suffering for you, which is your glory. Paul has laid out these two things, not only, or these three things rather. He says, not only is Jesus able to bring things back from the dead, not only was he able to bring us all back together, but he does it in the middle of suffering. He does it in the middle of hardship, in the middle of persecution. Paul is referencing his own suffering. And he's saying, look at how the gospel is flourishing, even though suffering is happening because of it. Look, people don't suffer for something that they just kind of think might be real, right? You're not gonna deal with persecution. You're not gonna be willing to face death and torture for something that you don't really believe, are you? But in spite of that, Paul's saying that even though the world is trying to crush this message, it's flourishing, it's growing. And I think, once again, to understand that, we've gotta look at Paul. We gotta look at Paul's bigger picture because Paul understands suffering in a way that many of us probably can't wrap our head around quite to the same degree. See, we talk about Paul a lot in in context of him being in prison, right? We'll always say, oh, Paul wrote this letter while he was in jail. He wrote this while he was in prison. Sometimes we'll minimize it a little bit. He's like, well, he was actually kind of under house arrest. So he had some freedom, but he was still in jail, imprisoned. But we need to really understand what that looked like for him because there was a lot of suffering that walked around that. Don't just take my words for it. I'm gonna paraphrase Paul's story here, but look at Acts 20 through 25 if you get the chance because this is where this piece of Paul's story all comes out. See, Paul has been sharing the gospel. He's been ministering specifically to the Gentiles. He's been serving in these communities for years. He's engaging people. He's challenging thinking. He's talking about Jesus. And then the Holy Spirit guides Paul back towards Jerusalem. And Paul looks at this and goes, I have a feeling if I go back there, I'm gonna get arrested and maybe killed. Like Paul realizes something's gonna happen, but he listens to the prompting of the Holy Spirit. He goes back to Jerusalem. And while he's in Jerusalem, that's exactly what ends up happening. He gets arrested. It happens because he's speaking at the temple. He's speaking in the synagogues. He's following all the rules but it's making the Jewish leaders mad. It's making the chief priests angry. And so they take him and they have him beaten and they bring him before a judge and they say, this guy needs to be put to death. We're done with him. He can't be doing this stuff. Well, the judge is looking at this whole situation and he's like, yeah, I, I don't really wanna deal with this. This isn't my thing. So just take him, take him out back, beat him. We'll investigate whether these claims are real and then we'll just move on. And so as Paul is being strung up to be beaten, Paul just happens to go, hey, do you guys think you should do this to a Roman citizen? And everyone in the room goes, whoa, 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 hold up. Uh, you're telling me you're a Roman citizen. Because see, they're not supposed to touch Roman citizens. Even the fact that he's tied up right now is a problem. 
The judge finds out that this is happening and the judge gets scared because all he has to do is plead to Caesar and all of a sudden all these guys in power are gonna have their heads rolling. You can't just beat up a Roman citizen. And so the judge actually brings back in the Jewish leaders. Paul's there in front of them. And Paul then is asked, why do they have a problem with you? And so Paul starts sharing the gospel again to these Jewish leaders. He talks about his Jewish credentials. He talks about his upbringing. He talks about all these things and then he tries to share Jesus with them and it just makes them even more angry. So angry to the point where a group of Jewish people that are part of this community have decided to take a vow where they will not eat food until Paul is dead. Well, I, I don't, they don't tell us what happened to that because Paul doesn't die for a few years. So I, I don't know what happened to them. Uh, it's kind of kind of a little piece that we're missing. But what ends up happening is, because these people are trying to kill Paul, he's arrested and placed in custody more for his protection than to try and seek justice. He's being protected from the very community that he grew up in. These would be his friends, his family. These are the people that he has spent his entire life around. And they now want him dead. See, being Jewish and, and living in temple and worshiping in the temple is not just a Sunday morning event. This is every single aspect of a Jewish person's life. They have spent their entire lives, the way that they work, the way that they, they eat meals with each other, the way in which they worship, all of their lives are surrounded by the church. And now he is being chased after for his death. The entire life that he has known has been completely flipped upside down, all for the sake of Jesus. See, if it weren't for Paul's Roman citizenship, he would have been beat up and left for dead. But because the Jewish leaders wanted him dead, they wanted him to stop talking about the way, he has to go into this protect, protective custody because they're constantly trying to kill him. Think about how incredible this is because even in the middle of that, the gospel is spreading. Paul writes letters to the church, most of the letters that we read while he's imprisoned. Think about how incredible that is, how powerful that is, how real that is. It's pretty crazy, because imagine with me, say that you find out the cure for some known disease, right? And you wanna start telling your neighbors about this cure because it's something that's kind of a big deal. What's the first thing that people are gonna ask? Well, where'd you get the cure? Ah, well, some guy sitting in jail. Yeah, nobody's gonna listen to you. Everyone's gonna think you're nuts. But here, the gospel of Jesus spreads even through Paul, who's sitting in jail. You know how crazy that is? That's another proof of the reality of how big the gospel of Jesus is. Because in spite of the persecution that comes when people accept the message of Jesus, in spite of the consequences, which believe me, for the early church was significantly worse than we like to think it is for us sometimes, right? They're, they're under the, the threat of death and suffering. It's a lot different than someone being mean to us on Facebook. We've got people here that are willing to go through that to share the gospel and in the middle of that hostility, the church explodes. It becomes this massive thing. The gospel is enough because Jesus is enough. So what does all of this have to do with us? <laughs> what does all of this have to do with the church in our everyday lives right now? Well, first, I think we do need to face a hard truth. And the first thing that we need to realize is just because we do have a relationship with Jesus, it doesn't magically make everything easier. Suffering is an aspect of what it means to follow Christ. And that's not a fun truth to be able to understand. I know it seems kind of weird to hear that coming from a pastor that's trying to convince you to follow Jesus, but when you've got somebody telling you, if you follow Jesus, you find life, but sometimes that life's not fun, that's challenging. A relationship with Jesus, believing that he is the son of God who suffered and died so that we could have life. When we choose to follow him, it's what makes us right with God. It's what gives us real and abundant life but hard things still happen. Hard things still come, suffering still happens. But what our, what our relationship with Jesus does though, is in the middle of that hurt, in the middle of that suffering, it gives us the arms of someone who has suffered. 
It gives us the arms of somebody who comes alongside us and suffers with us through it to help carry us through it. It gives us hope and peace and joy when there's no business in those things being around in the first place. This message, this reality of the life that comes from Christ has to change the way in which we live our lives. It has to come to this place where we become transformed and the mission of our lives, the motivation of our lives has to change when we begin to recognize what Jesus has done and what he is able to do in the middle of the ugly stuff in our lives. So how do we do that? Paul, in a lot of ways, has actually been laying this out this whole time we've been in the book of Ephesians. He's been talking through these different proofs, but those different proofs are also the way in which we engage the world around us. We need to learn to share Jesus in the way that we talk about him. Ephesians 2.8, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It is not of your own doing, but it is a gift from God. When we begin to talk about the reality that nothing we did earned us the right relationship with God. When we begin to talk about the truth that it is a gift that he offered us, people can begin to understand that it's not about how good you are. It's about how willing you are to lay it down for his sake to be able to accept the gift that he's offered and to follow him wherever that leads. Helping see that nothing we have done is so crucial. Telling people about the incredible grace in both our actions and our words, the way in which we live our lives and the way in which we talk about Jesus. Because every single one of us is put in a unique mission field. Every one of us has a circle of influence that is slightly different than everyone else's. There are people that you are going to talk to and you are going to see that I will never interact with in my life. Are you taking the opportunity to share about this amazing grace of Jesus? Are you taking this opportunity to be willing to show people what he can do? Your jobs, your family, your everyday relationships, your lives, those things are unique to you. How are you allowing the gospel of Jesus to infiltrate the way in which you live your lives in your own context? This doesn't have to mean beating people over the head with the Bible, because I think sometimes we do that and the consequences are detrimental for sure. But it does mean learning to give an answer to the reason why you have joy and hope, especially when things are hard. Why your life is able to be different, because you're walking a life with Jesus and you should be different because of that. The second thing that we see from Paul then is the way in which we interact with the people around us has to be different as well. The places in my life where I've had the most success in sharing Jesus with them, with people, places where Jesus has been able to transform people's lives are because I have built relationship with people first. It's because they have taken the priority in my life, even in situations where there are people that aren't the same as me. See, Paul has just laid this out, this idea, this beauty of how all are welcome in the body of Christ. So how are we allowing our relationships to be a place where we can engage people for Jesus? The whole second half of chapter two of Ephesians, that's what Paul is laying out, that Jesus is the great unifier. We can break down these barriers of division that keep us apart and we can share him in the midst of community. So what relationship in your life right now do you know that you need to have some conversations about Jesus with? Think of someone. I'm sure there's someone in your life if you think of that name, write it down. Don't let this thing become, become something that you just let float to the wayside as soon as we leave here and go ahead to lunch. Who do you know that you can talk to about Jesus and you can show Jesus in the way in which you live your lives? Because that's the third way that he's laying these things out. How do we exist in the midst of adversity? When things are hard, what does your life look like? Because when you respond in joy and hope, when the whole world around you is falling apart, people look at that and they go, man, how do I get a part of that? Like, what's wrong with you? That's not normal. When we learn to lean on Jesus in the hard things of life, in the unemployment, in the sickness, in the pain, in the loss, when we learn to rely on Jesus in the middle of that stuff, that's when we can make inroads to boast about how great our God is. That's how we can make inroads to talk about how Jesus has transformed something fundamental about who we are. 
And we're able to praise him in the middle of hard things. We're able to praise him and worship him in everything that we are. You know, it's easy to thank God when you're the multimillionaire sports star who just scored a touchdown. It's a little bit harder when the world around you is falling apart, when you're in danger of being thrown out in the streets and losing your home, when your health is at risk and failing, when you're in pain. But isn't that the more compelling reality of a gospel that's real? When you're still able to worship the God of the universe, even in the middle of the hurt, even in the middle of the pain, in the middle of the suffering. The gospel is enough. As we wrap things up here this morning, the team's gonna come up and we're actually gonna play a song that wouldn't be a song that we typically play on a Sunday morning. We, we try and pick things that are a little more congregational, easier to sing along together with. But this song is such an amazing opportunity for us to slow down and reflect on this reality, on this truth that the gospel is enough. The song is called, Even When It Hurts. And the whole, the whole concept of this song is, how do we praise God even when life is falling apart? Even when things are painful, even when things hurt, in the middle of the suffering? Because maybe that's where you find yourself right now. Maybe you walked in here today thinking, I, mean, I don't know if I can do another step. I tell you what, I've, I've had a pretty massively hard couple weeks. Uh, I had my grandfather pass away and just watching the way in which everyone's kind of dealing with the hurt and dealing with the pain and myself trying to deal with it as well. It's been tough. But in the middle of that, being able to point back at Jesus and say, you know what? This doesn't surprise you. You've got this figured out. You're carrying us through. And you're allowing us to be in a position where now maybe someone else can see Jesus because of what we're going through. Maybe that's where you find yourself today. You're carrying something that hurts. Reflect. I'm gonna be up here in the front. Andrea's gonna be up here as well. Potentially Tucker, he told me no, but I'm gonna say his name anyway. We've got the folks at the hub. We're just gonna be available to you if you need prayer. If you find yourself in a place where you're like, man, I don't know if I can do this anymore. It hurts. Let us pray with you and just remind you of who the Savior is. Or maybe you're in that situation where you haven't made that decision to follow him at all yet. Maybe you're at this place where you, you might be thinking, maybe this thing is real, but you haven't made that decision to take the step. Come talk to us. Let us pray with you. Let us help you understand what it means to follow him. Because we would love to be able to say, hey, you're 100% part of the family. You've joined in because then together, we can walk through this together. We can walk through the hard stuff together. We can carry each other all under the banner of Jesus. So as the team plays, reflect. Can I mean these words if I sing them? And if you need it, come forward, pray. Like I said, the hub will be up front here. Come on forward, let's, let's pray together. So I'm gonna pray for us before they start this song. Father God, we just, Lord, we praise you that you are such a great and awesome and amazing God, that you are willing to help us in the middle of the suffering, that you're willing to be the one to come alongside us and let us experience you when the world around us feels like it can't stay together. God, you are a great and awesome and mighty God. And we just pray that today you remind us that even though things are hard and things hurt and things might suck, that you've got our backs, not just to relieve the suffering, but to carry us through it. We love you, Lord. And we just pray that you teach our hearts to worship you in the middle of the hurt. Let's reflect and process and pray over these things.
Even when my strength is lost, I'll praise you. Even when I have no song, I'll praise you. Even when it's hard to find the words louder than I'll sing your praise. I will only sing your praise. Take this mountain weight. Take these oceans. Even when the fight seems lost, I'll praise you. Even when it hurts like hell, I'll praise you. Even when it makes no sense to sing louder than I'll sing your praise.
And if you're still praying, don't let me interrupt you, but um, man, if you, if you didn't come up here and get prayer, that's, that's okay. Um, I, just know that we're, we're always here for you. Um, reach out to us, whatever, whatever that looks like. Uh, swing by the hub. Come find Pastor Dan after service. Uh, man, your whole message, all, all I can think of, if Jesus never did and one more thing for us, what he did on the cross is enough. And just like, just like Dan said, the gospel of Jesus Christ is enough. And uh, man, we're so blessed as a church to um, just receive that grace on the cross and uh, be able to take that gospel message and um, actually get the privilege. I was thinking while we were talking about the gospels enough, we, get, we have a team of uh, high schoolers that are going to Kentucky in a week. I'm gonna invite them all up here. If you, all, my, all my missions people will come up, all the leaders, all the, all the students, if you guys will come on up here. And so they're, they're all going to, we're, we're leaving on Saturday. Saturday at noon, we're leaving and going to Kentucky. Um, and all of these students, they'll be, whether it's in kids ministry, whether it's in construction, whether it's in the community, they'll be, they'll be going to Kentucky and spreading the gospel. They'll be the hands and feet of the gospel. And uh, we, we didn't want to send, send them out um, on this mission trip without you guys praying over them, continuing to partner with them in prayer. Um, so, so we're gonna pray over all of them this morning. I invited Julie to come up. Scott, will you grab that mic back there, Kelly's mic? Thank you. Um, and I'll, actually, you, you start off and then, and then I'll close us out. So if you guys would, just stretch your hands towards these students. Let, let's pray over them. Father God, I just thank you for this opportunity to commission these students and leaders to do what you have planned for them, Father. I thank you for being the God that you are. God, I just pray that each and every one of these individuals know that you have an intricate part in your plan for them to step into as they head out to, out to Kentucky to do your work. God, I just pray that um, you give them courage to be your hands and feet, Father, in uncomfortable situations that they will step out to share your love and your mercy and your grace to all of those that they come in contact with. God, I pray for um, travel mercies, Father, as they travel, watch over them. Um, may you put your hedge of protection around them, Father. And whenever they get to get there, Father, the situation that they step into, Father, that um, this is gonna change them as much as it is the people that they are going to come in contact with. Deuteronomy 31.8 says, you have gone before us. You have set up divine appointments for each and every one of these individuals, Father. I pray you give them the strength and the courage to step into those appointments and to see you work in every single step. God, you are a God that is beyond what we can imagine. You are a huge, huge God, Father. So anything we ask, Father, we know that you can do. So Father, I pray for signs of miracles and wonders that these kids are gonna be able to experience and adults as well. God, I pray for relationships. I pray for um, strength in their faith that this trip they come back and they are just full of God's stories of things that you have done that are far beyond what they could have imagined would happen. I pray for life changes, Father, that you would just work within them and that they would always be able to have their testimony to fall back on when times get hard. God, I thank you for this opportunity that they're stepping into. Keep them, Father, um, close to your heart. Father, open minds, open eyes, open ears, open hearts to do your will. Thank you, Jesus. Lord, I just echo what Julie prayed. And Lord, I just I just pray that this is a, a trip for the students. It's, we know it's more blessed to give than to receive. And I just pray as, as they go, this is what they receive from this trip as they serve the community there in Kentucky, that um, it's just something they remember for the rest of their life, that it's a moment that they um, that just impacts them, uh, whether it's spiritually, personally, relationally, whatever that is, Lord. I just, I just pray for a lifelong impact on this trip, Lord, not just for them, but also for the community, Lord. I pray for just, as Julie said, just divine appointments for them to uh, share the gospel message, to, to serve that community and to love that community as you would, Lord. God, I just, I just pray that you just um, guide them, protect them. Uh, Lord, just, uh, it'll be a fun trip, but it'll, it'll also be one where uh, we, we just advance your kingdom and we love you and we thank you for the opportunity. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. y'all give these students a hand up here. I'll let you guys sit down because I know you guys hate being on stage. I'll, I'll keep talking, but you guys go ahead and sit down. Um, 
But if, if you want to continue to partner with these students, I announced it last week, but you can actually sponsor some of the projects that they're working on. Um, so if you want to do that before they go, um, you can do that on our app, our Push Pay app, and you can select the Kentucky Missions Trip, or you can, you can give that to our um, offering boxes in the back. But I encourage you guys to continue praying over them. There's prayer guides over at the Hub that have all their pictures in it. Um, and not just them, but there's, there's students in Chambersburg, the students in Greencastle all going. So I just continue to pray over them and pray over this trip as they, as they leave next week. Uh, but a couple announcements before you as you go. Um, one, we, I announced it last week, but anybody likes Christmas in July? Does anybody celebrate Christmas in July? Nobody. It's my birthday. It's okay. My birthday is the 26th. You can celebrate my birthday. Um, but as, as a church, the Shoebox Warehouse, which is right down the street, we're going to, we're gonna, as a church, we have boxes here that you can take home. You can pack if you would like, um, and you can bring them back here. Um, and those, those will go to the Shoebox Warehouse. Or as a church, since we get the blessing of having the, the warehouse in our uh, community, we're actually going there on the 14th as a church from 6 to 8. Uh, it's $17 a box. You don't have to bring anything. They have all the supplies, so you can just pay for as many boxes as you want, pack the boxes up as a family. Um, so that'll be next Saturday from six to eight if you wanna be a part of that. Um, the other announcement I have is uh, signups for our re-engage marriage ministry are open again. Um, so I have a couple announcements on that. We've, we've had a lot of questions of, hey, is there gonna be, I don't wanna drive to Chambersburg, I wanna re-engage here in Shippensburg. And I, I'm telling you, it's, I've heard some great stories coming from it. Um, but what we need, we need somebody to step up and be a leader. The reason there is none here in, in Shippensburg is that we don't have anybody that wants to lead it. Uh, but if you wanna lead it, you have to be a part of the class to go through it once first. So if you wanna lead a group here in Shippensburg with Reengage, go find Pastor Dan, let him know that so we can get you signed up for that because we would love for that to be a, a ministry we have here in Shippensburg as well, but we need a leader to do it. So if you feel, uh, pray about it, and if you feel God's pulling you to do that, leading you to do that, lead, lead our marriages because our church is only as healthy as our marriages are. Go find Dan uh, and let him know you want to be a part of that. But if you're like, hey, I just want to be a part of the class, um, it doesn't matter if your marriage is bad. It doesn't matter if it's great. Whatever it is, it's, it's just a fantastic way to, uh, to, to connect um, and to re-engage, re like it's called, with, with, your, uh, with your marriage. So uh, sign up for that. You can scan the QR code or swing by the hub and talk to them. They'll, they can sign you up there as well. Um, but other than that, our offering boxes are on the back, both sides of the tech table and by the door. Uh, that's just a way for us as a family. We give. If it's your first time, we don't expect that, but that's there for you. Uh, but we love you guys and we will see you next week.